All right, you guys, welcome everyone to the Refuge Center. Let's go ahead and, uh, man, if you're visiting for the first time or listening online, as always, we're a direct overflow of Calvary Chapel Grants Pass. But that being said, you guys, let's just go ahead and stand if you're able. And I'm just going to lead us into prayer as Wendy, my wife, beautiful wife, uh, leads us into some worship. So, Heavenly Father, Lord God, we just thank you for tonight. God, we thank you for your word and just for... God, just how good you are time and time again. God, so I do pray for tonight. God, I pray, Lord, that you would just be ministered to. God, and that as we just uh, glorify you, God, or seek to glorify you, God, that you would just speak to us. God, you deal with the things that need to be dealt with, God. And man, may it just be a night of fellowship and worship and uh, just walk in all you have. God, so we love you and we ask these things in your name. Amen. Amen. There's nothing worth more that will ever come close nothing can compare you are living hope your presence more hard to sit and sing of the sweetest of love Comes free, and my shame is undone. Your presence, Lord. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here. Come flood this place and fill the Yeah. 
out to save high and set free oh, 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 oh. high and set free oh, 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 oh. it is for freedom that I am set free set free oh, 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 oh. I am set free
just want you Nothing else Nothing else Nothing else will do I just want you Nothing else Nothing else Nothing else will do I just want you Nothing else Nothing else Nothing else will do I just want you Nothing else Nothing else Nothing else will do I'm caught up in your presence Jesus, I'm right here at your feet I'm caught up in this hole Jesus, you don't hold me anything more than anything that you can do. I just want you. Psalm 62. I... Just give me a heads up when you guys are there. Are you amen? Heads up. That's right. Not me. <laughs> Psalm 62. Let's pick up in verse 1. The title is, My Soul Waits for God Alone. Verse 1. For God alone my soul waits in silence. From him comes my salvation. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be greatly shaken. Verse 3, how long will all of you attack a man to batter him? Like a leaning wall with a tottering fence, they only plan to thrust him down from his high position. They take pleasure in falsehood. They bless with their mouth, but inwardly they curse. For God alone, O oh my soul, wait in silence, for my hope is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. On God rests my salvation and my glory, my mighty rock. My refuge is God. Verse 8, trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Those of low estate are but a breath. Those of high estate are a delusion. In the balances they go up. They are altogether lighter than a breath. Put no trust in exhortion. Set no vain hope on robbery. If riches increase, Set not your heart on them. Once God has spoken, twice have I heard this, that power belongs to God, and that to you, O Lord, belongs steadfast love, for you will render to a man according to his work. Let's pray. And so, Heavenly Father, Lord God, we just thank you for this time one more time. God, we pray that you just be over this time, God, that as we get into your word and just explore your thoughts and your heart towards us, your thoughts and your heart towards your creation, God, we'd be caught in a moment of understanding, God, how merciful and loving you really are, God, and how you only want the best for us. God, so we love you, we thank you, and we ask these things in your name, amen. Well, James chapter 1, verse 12 reads, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Psalms chapter 9, verse 9, The Lord is a stronghold for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. And so I've told tonight's thought, tonight's message, rising above the currents of life in a godly manner, rising above the currents of life in a godly manner. And so what we're going to see is that God so much is not in service, but God speaks in silence. God doesn't always speak so much in activity, 
as he does in silence and reflection. And so what we see as we open this passage, we see that God is true, and all those who wait for him, according to Romans, will not be put to shame. And I bring this up because I think many times, as many of us are, we have a tendency to not be able to be still. We have a tendency to uh, bring so many things into our life that we almost kind of keep God's hand or keep God's voice at a distance, where if I just uh, consume more and spend more time at church and just live a, uh, just a robust, a healthy life, if I just keep moving and going, I'll figure it out. But no, we see God is wanting to speak in silence. And so what we see is that first and foremost, David has a confident expectation for God to move. And so I ask you this evening as we explore this text, are you waiting for God in your life? Are you expecting that he actually wants to bless you? And he actually has plans, according to Jeremiah 29, to prosper you, to give you a hope in a future? And I bring this up because many, like myself, would naturally say no I believe God is indifferent to suffering. I believe God is indifferent to trials or how we live our life. But what we see according to Scripture and according to the text, and again, I've mentioned this, but have you ever noticed the Bible? It makes no attempt to explain away the existence of God. It makes no attempt to try to defend the existence of God. Rather, God is and God was and God will always be. And so Psalms 27, verses 2 to 3, When evildoers assail me to eat my flesh, my adversaries and foes, it is they who stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war rise against me, yet I will be confident. And so I ask you again, are you waiting on the Lord? Are you waiting for that still small voice to speak in counsel? Or are you trusting that he's not against you, but that he's for you? And he's not out to rob you or take something from you, but he is out to give you life and to prosper you and to lead you all the way. And so we see that there's abundance of satisfaction and there's abundance for the reality of those who turn and lean into the gospel that God has never been against you, dear friend. God is patient waiting for you to have a conversation with him. And so first and foremost, we see that David is trusting in God by stating that he is not above God. David is trusting in God by choosing to be quiet before his Savior. And I think that's key because many times, rather than waiting for the Lord or waiting for his thoughts, I give him all my opinions on things. And there's not anything wrong with this because we see the later part of the text that says, pour out your heart to God. But we see there's a balance, as Solomon says, he is in heaven and you are not. Therefore, we will let our words be few. And so the word here for wait, it literally means to calm oneself, to steady oneself. to be quiet, to rest, to trust, that God wants to speak something to you. Psalm 62, verses 1 through 2, For God alone my soul waits in silence. From him comes my salvation. He alone is my rock and my salvation. My fortress, I shall not be greatly shaken. And so we see that David is understanding that there is a quiet trust to be had for the servants of God. Psalms 42, 2. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My soul thirsts for God. Dear friend, what are you consuming your life with? And what are you consuming your time with? Recently, there was a study done. Apparently, new smartphones actually have a tracker to see how much you're picking them up and how much time you're spending on each app. The average individual picked up their phone over 80 times in a day. One author, one of the speaker actually go on on to say where I gleaned this point from, that he had chosen to pick up his phone over 160 times in a single day. And so we see that we cannot worship until we let go of our agenda. 
We cannot worship until we let go of what we think or how we think, you know, what we decide is going to happen. Hey, you know, I bring this up because, hey, you know, maybe you're not so much into social media. Maybe you're not so much into your phone. Oh, dear Christian, do you not think that you keep God at a distance with your other hobbies? Do you not think that you keep God at a distance with your other idols? And I say this gracefully because we see that God is a God of mercy, but it remains the same that God is not in service. God is speaking in silence. And so what does it mean to trust God? As David is now uh, faced with this situation, and to be honest, we don't know what's going on. And I think, you know, that's okay. Because I think sometimes when we know what's going on in the text, we're tempted to maybe take uh, verses, you know, apply it to this situation or apply it to this situation, that situation. But we don't know what's going on with David. Yeah, there were many who say that he could be on the run from Absalom, which, uh, you know, personally, I believe as we get more into the text, there is room for this. But whether it was the Philistines, whether it was Saul, whether it was Absalom hunting David, David was no stranger to heart hard times. And if I had to guess, you and I have not been strangers to hard times. If I had to guess, many of you have some serious issues in your life. Some of the issues that have stemmed from other people and living in a broken world and some of the issues stemming from our own personal disobedience. And so first and foremost, you know, because as I was reading this text, as I was kind of going through Psalm 62 again, one of the thoughts that hit me is, what does it mean to really trust in the Lord? What does it mean to really give your willing heart to him? First and foremost, we see it is an obedient trust. It is a trust that decides come hell or high water, literally at times, you are going to walk with God. It is a trust that decides that whatever happens, whoever leaves, whoever falters, whatever happens, that you, as, as Joshua said, as for me and my household, we're going to serve the Lord. So it's an obedient trust. It's choosing to stay, and it's choosing, as the Scripture says, Daniel purposed in his heart. Have you purposed in your heart this evening that you're going to be obedient even when times get hard? Because I'll be honest, most times I'm not. Most times I'm floundering and just just spazzing out, and I look so much more like the world than the church. David trusted in God alone, says Pastor David Guzik, for his strength and stability. The description is of a man completely focused upon God for his help, firmly resolved to look nowhere else. David trusted in God alone for his strength. Spurgeon goes on to say, the tried believer not only abides in God as in a cavernous rock, but dwells in him as a soldier in some brave and defiant tower or a lordly castle. The tried believer not only abides in God as in a cavernous rock, but dwells in him as a warrior or soldier in some bravely defiant tower or lordly castle, David is saying, I will not be moved. And it's not anything that we do ourselves. See, see, this is what, when I break down this passage, this is what's so comforting, is that God's going to do it for you. As you put your trust in the Lord, David, God is going to deliver for you. As you choose not to go back to your own designs and schemes, David, God is going to do it for you. As you choose not to exalt yourself, but rather humble yourself, David, God is going to deliver. Job 13, though he slay me, I will hope in him. And we see this at the end of Job's life. It says that he was blessed more. And I bring this up because many times we don't look like Job. We look like Peter. We look like the disciple that doesn't want to follow Jesus too close. Hey, 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 it's okay. I'll come to church. I'll sing a couple songs. But hey, you start honing in on my hobbies or my idols, you start honing in on my own personal beliefs. No, Lord, you you just take care of the universe. I'll guide my life. No, be encouraged that as Job chose to trust, in the end he was vindicated. In the end he was exalted. 
And I love this because we see that in the end, God's not against us. God's not against you. And some of us need to hear that this evening, that God is not angry with you, that God is not against you, that God is not waiting for you to make mistakes. God is not waiting to strike you down. God is not waiting for you to screw up as he knew you would. No, he's waiting just to have a conversation with his child. God is not so much in service. He is in silence. God is so full of mercy that it belongs to him as if all the mercy in the universe came from God and still was claimed by him as his possession. God is so full of mercy that it belongs to him as if all the mercy in the universe came from God and still was claimed by him as his possession. Go ahead, turn to Hebrews 4 briefly. Hebrews 4, and you all can just give an amen and in there. Hebrews 4, and I just want to read the first. couple verses. Hebrews 4, pick him verse 1, it reads, Therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us fear lest any of you should have seemed to have failed to reach it. For good news came to us just as to them, children of Israel, but the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listen. For we who have believed enter that rest, as he said, as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Although his works were finished from the foundation of the world, for he has somewhere spoken of the seventh day in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again, in this passage, they he said, they shall not enter my rest. And so secondly, we see it is an Active rest. It is an active rest. It, you know, waiting on God doesn't mean I don't do anything. Waiting on God doesn't mean that I just sit around waiting for everything to happen. No, you have bills, go to work. You have a wife who's hurting, minister to her. We get into this fatalism where we decide, well, if God's going to do it, I can just kick back. No, it is an active rest. And I love this because what we see secondly, that David's own have turned against him. And so here we have the text. It's set up. There's the contrast of David standing in his righteousness, but the foes of David or the enemies of David, who, by the way, some of them were close to him. That's why it says in the Psalms, I've been betrayed. I've been forsaken. Some of them were his own, uh, you know, his, his own clan, maybe even potentially his own family members. Who knows? But what we do see is that David, he's not exchanging blow for blow. And I bring up Hebrews 4 because Hebrews 4 is talking specifically about rest. It's talking about the rest that God brought in Genesis. It's talking about the rest that was offered to the children of Israel. It's talking about the rest that's offered for you and me this very evening if we would seize from our own self-righteousness and simply admit that we are broken souls in need of a savior. Are you broken this evening? Because I am. And I am not ashamed. I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it has the power to save. Know your own worthiness in the sight of God, dear Christian. You were beloved and chosen. We see that they can't even find fault fairly. David's foes have to gossip and lie, and slander. And so what we see, secondly, is that when the enemy cannot conquer, he will divide in this. That when the enemy cannot come head on, he will find ways to creep in through the church. He will find ways to creep into your marriage. It's why you guys are arguing while you're on your way to church. It's why you guys are fighting, even though you guys have just rented a movie and it was supposed to be a good night. Because the enemy loves to take what's true and good and pure and right and twist it and crank it and manipulate it to the point where it's not even recognizable. 
Psalm 62, verses 3 through 4. How long will all of you attack a man to batter him like a leaning wall, a tottering fence? They only plan to thrust him down from his high position. They take pleasure in falsehood. They bless with their mouths, but inwardly they curse. And so two points. First and foremost, don't ever trust smooth words. When someone is constantly building you up, be careful where they're leading. Be careful what they're doing. And I'm not saying be so self-righteous that you can't receive a compliment. But what I am saying is that when someone is continuously all the time in your corner praising you, be watchful. Be alert. Secondly, gossip is sinful. That's it. No ifs, ands, and buts. If you are gossiping, stop it. That, it's that simple. And I bring this up because you ever notice how when you're going through something hard and you necessarily agree with spiritual leadership or you don't necessarily agree even with the Lord with what the Lord's doing suddenly you just start chirping away little comments you start backbiting you start saying well if I was in charge I'd do it like this <laughs> hey Absalom where you been Absalom is David's son by the way who the one who would overthrow the kingdom he would stand by the gate and say without naming David. I think it's so poetic, and we won't go there for the sake of time, but he never even names David. He just says, hey, your cause, your problem is right and just, but there's no king. If I were king, I would take care of it. No, no, no. Proverbs says that gossip is like a north wind that tears through and divides families and tears down souls. And so that's a word for someone that you, if you have a problem with someone, go to that person. Don't go around gossiping. What we see is that God is in the midst of restoration. God is in the midst of healing and bringing back together. And God is in the midst of holding you up when you feel you have nothing left. You, you know, lots of people say that the leaning wall and tottering fence is David and he's about to stumble. I don't think that's it at all because when you look at the context of the Psalms, he's actually very bold and very confident. At this point, David, he has the right to take his hand to this situation. And he is the right. You ever notice that sometimes the biggest blows in life come not when you're guilty, but rather when you're innocent and you have the right to strike back. The biggest blows come in life when you have something to say, when you have something, when you have a bone to pick. And what we see through the life of David is that he's a picture of Christ, and so we see that God works not so much in self exaltation, but rather self-denial. Behold a king, says Spurgeon, the greatest that ever lived, a profound politician, an able general, a brave soldier, a poet of the most sublime genius and character, a prophet of the most high and the deliverer of his country, driven from his dominions by his own son, abandoned by his own fickle people. Who does that sound like, you guys? Sounds like our Savior. Sounds like Jesus, the one who paid the sins, pay, paid for my sins and for your sins, driven out by his own people, driven out by our own self-righteousness, driven out by our own busyness, driven out by our own ideas of the gospel where we think we're smarter than we are. Isaiah 53, 7, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, third, we see it is a joyful and a prayerful trust. It is a joyful trust knowing that this life may bring sickness and death, and this life might bring all that it has, but it holds nothing on our King. It holds nothing on our Savior, and it holds nothing on the blood of Jesus, the cross of Calvary, who speaks a better word than the blood of Abel, who speaks life into death and calls into existence, according to Romans, things that do not exist. God is not against you. He is for you. Amen. For God alone, oh my soul, Psalm 62, 5 through 8. It waits in silence. You know the word there for silence is to be quiet to the point where you're assumed to be dumb? 
Yeah, yeah, you, you, you want to talk about, you want to talk about some real maturity? David's talking about being holding your tongue when you have the right to lash out to the point where people think you might not be all there. People think that you might not be able to defend yourself. No, this is a beautiful picture of our suffering servant who held the world in his hand and could call down, what did he say in the garden? Oh, I'll call down legions of angels right now. But it's for this moment that I came. And so know in your life the moments of suffering. God is in the midst. And God is with you, walking with you. And the greatest freedom that comes is when we finally just stop and realize that we're just souls looking for God. That we're souls just looking for a heavenly home. And so let's get ready to close out. For God alone, oh, my soul, wait in silence, for my hope is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. On God rests my salvation and my glory. My mighty rock, my refuge is God. Trust in him at all times. O oh, people, pour out your heart before him. The word here for refuge, by the way, it's a shelter from storms or a shelter from those who would slander you, a shelter from those who would bring falsehood in your life. I love this because what this shows me and what this tells me is I don't have to be my own defender. I, I, I don't have to battle or, or fight for my own case. Yeah, we use wisdom. God gave us minds. God gave us common sense. No, but in, in the intricate things of life and the things where we really want to take them back into our hands, no, it's in that moment that you don't have to do it. You can wait on the Lord. Why? Because Isaiah 40, 31, but they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Isaiah 64, 4, from of old, no one has heard or perceived or perceived by the ear. No eye has seen a God besides you who acts for those who wait for him. No eye has seen a God besides you who acts for those who wait for him. Fourth, it is a loyal trust. It is a demanding trust, knowing that I will walk with my Savior, whatever happens in this life, because this isn't just preaching to the choir. This is day in, day out when you want to quit. This is day in, day out when all of life is turned against you, and things you thought you were going to pan out didn't pan out, and people you thought had your back are now slandering and coming against you. No, it's in that moment, God will require an account from each man. God will require an account for all of us. Those of low estate are but a breath. Those of high estate are a delusion. In the balances they go up, they are together lighter than a breath. Put no exhortion, set no vain hopes on robbery. Why would he say that? Because David was a soldier. David knew what it was like to rob the Philistines. David knew what it was like to rob the enemy. David knew what it was like to send his men to strike down a household when he was denied bread. David knew what it was like to put it into movement this very moment. David was a man of action. David was a man of self-ability, and David lived by the sword. Ironically enough, he wouldn't die by the sword. But he lived by the sword. And so I think that's interesting because he actually goes so far to say, even in the grand schemes of life, when you're ready to rip someone off, it's not worth it. Even in the grand schemes of life, when you have the right or the ability to just hijack a situation and use it for your own good. So according to this passage, all our days are known by God. Once God has spoken, twice have I heard this, that power belongs to God and that to you, O Lord, belongs steadfast love, for you will render to a man according to his work. Our days are known by the Lord. So what we're going to do is I'm going to close out in prayer at this point. 
But I just want to read a quote. It's going to be a lofty for some of us. But I think there's beauty in it, just being reminded that we're not in heaven and God is. This author goes on to say, So immutable is God that he need not speak twice as though he had changed his mind. So infallible that one utterance suffices, for he cannot err. So omnipotent that his solitary word achieves all his designs. We speak often and say nothing. God speaks once and utters eternal commands. All of our speaking may yet end in sound, but he speaks and it is done. He commands and it stands fast. We serve a reigning and a living king. And death could not and did not stop him. So the destruction and the lies of the enemy in your life that say you're not worthy, that you have no right, that you're incapable, that your best years are behind you. (laughs) Mahalo's like, speak for yourself. God is on your side. And many of us, just like David, would take the situation and yank it back into our own hands. But here in Psalm 62, we're reminded that's not the way of the Christian. That's not the way of you as a follower of Christ. Now, I'm not saying that you just go quiet to the point where, you know, we're not talking about fatalism or hyper-Calvinism. We use our minds. We use what God has given us. But in the grand scheme of things, you chuck it, you give it to God, and you let it go. Because God's a better author. Let's pray. And so, Heavenly Father, Lord God, we just thank you for this time. And I pray now just for anyone, God, just struggling with um, many different things. God, would you just remind us, God, that we are forgiven and loved. God, that though we make mistakes and We make mistakes often and grand ones at that. God, you are a God of mercy waiting to restore. God, so for anyone here who doesn't know you or maybe isn't sure where they stand with you, God, we confess of our need of a Savior, Jesus Christ, the King of Kings. God, we ask that you would come into our life and teach us how to live by your Holy Spirit. For those who have fallen away, God, we confess our sins and we say that we need to come back to you. We confess our own inability to earn our salvation and say salvation belongs to the Lord alone. God, would you bless us and keep us? God, we love you. We ask these things in your name. Amen. All right, you guys, God bless. Stick around for fellowship.